Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Influential Women Podcast. I have Miss Dotsie Baxter in the house today. Hello and welcome, Miss Dotsie. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's been a while since I've seen you. How's everything going? Because you've recently just moved from Pueblo to Canyon City. We did. Yes, and enjoying retired life, or are you not retired fully? So, personally, I'm not retired fully. So, believe it or not, I'm actually um, a little older than my husband. Uh And so I am working so that we still have health benefits because that's unfortunately one of the things that we have to do in this world. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm still working for Parkview. And you're still at Parkview. You just can't get Parkview out of your blood, huh? Oh my gosh. If you're going to work in the area, it's a great place to work. It really is. I love Parkview and we're so blessed to have it here in, in our community. So is this your first ever podcast? It is. It is. So it's fun and I'm excited to share your story and highlight you. So First, just tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, So I am a transplant from Pennsylvania, but I've actually been in Colorado uh, more than half my life, Uh, Southern Colorado for about the last 30 years. And uh, my profession has been in health information management, which is basically what people would know as medical records. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's been a really, really good job and a profession that has kept me um, employed and professionally engaged for, you know, over 30 years. Uh, sort of unexpectedly. That's awesome. And you're a mother and a wife. Tell me a little bit about your family. I am. um, I have three boys. Uh, They were, uh, I have a set of twins and I have one that's 14 months older than them. So I had three little ones that were very close in age. Um, Enjoyed raising them tremendously. We had a bunch of fun and they are now in their mid twenties. Two of them are in Denver working and one is in Illinois in veterinary school. Oh, which one's in vet school? Jake. Jake. So both of the twins are not in Denver. It's they Colin and, oh, okay. Colin and Sam, yeah. Oh, so. well, you have to be proud because, you know, I had the honor of teaching her boys when I used to be a teacher. And oh, that's right. They, what sweet boys. Like, just, like, you know, well-rounded. They were smart. They were athletic. They were kind. You know, they had so and many amazing ordering. clothes. Oh, yeah. But that, they're boys. <laughs> yeah. So real quick, how was that being a mother? Because that's really close in age. So 14 months apart. And then you have a set of twins. I mean, how were that those first five years of parenthood for you? Yeah, I'm sure um, my memory is, I'm sure, not great on that because you just sort of survive every day. Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought it went pretty well. You know, they were all in the same um, age group. They watched the same movies. We read the same books. When they started sports, they were in the same sports teams. Um, we didn't have girls and boys going two different directions. We didn't have huge age gaps. So... Um, we had a bunch of us at any given time, but we were all in one place or another. So that kind of was actually easier than some people's families, I think. Well, that's awesome. And you, right away, you just pulled out all the positives from it. You know, like I think sometimes as moms will we'll tend to go to the negatives like, oh, it was this and that. But I respect you just came out with a ton of positives because I had two that were 13 months apart. And I have twins on the second one. But did you have a tribe to help you out or was it just you and... Well, I did, I did have my mom, my mother, she was 80 years old, I think, when they were born. And she came down to my house every single night for nine months oh, um, wow. and helped so that we had one adult per baby. Oh. And uh, that, that was uh, tremendously helpful. And the day that she kind of told me she had other things to do with her days um, and wasn't going to be coming down every night, I cried, I'm sure. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, she was tremendously helpful. Of course, Mike, um, my husband was, you know, he would get home as very fast as he could uh, to be helpful. And, um, you know, and I worked just a little bit during those times, kind of doing some volunteer work, doing some part-time work. So I was available to, to be there for them as much as, you know, as much as they needed. And now it, it looks like y'all just have this amazing friendship. Like you have a wonderful bond between your sons. It seems that way. Yeah. Yeah. We're really, uh, we enjoy each other. And, um, but also, you know, they're independent and have lives and boy, are they busy. Mm-hmm. So, and talk to me about your relationship and your marriage. Oh, geez. <laughs> um, you know, we, I so think it looks like, I mean, it doesn't look like you guys are just two loving people and you just make your marriage work. It's not always easy. I know that. <laughs> um, you know, we, we do have a great team, and um, one of the reasons that I'm still working is because when the kids were little and Mike was working, and he was working a lot, he had, you know, very high-level professional positions that kept him, uh, you know, sometimes late nights into meetings and early mornings into meetings. He said, 
you know, I will, you know, you work as much or as little as you need to while raising these kids. And then when it's time for me to retire, if you would be able to go back to work to be able to, you know, carry the benefits, the health benefits for this family. And that was kind of our arrangement. So I, you know, he really left it up to me as to how much I, um, you know, would work uh, while the kids were little. And now in reciprocation, you know, he's retired and I'm back at work um, just doing as much as I need to do to uh, carry the health benefits for the family. Um, and that'll be about another five years, I think. Another five years. That is awesome. Oh, yeah. I love that. So it's a good, it's a good teamwork, I guess, is teamwork. the point. And that's, yeah. what, that's what you do. Um, and how was it? Because, you know, for those of you who are, are listening in who maybe don't know Dotsie or don't know her husband, her husband, Mike Baxter, was CEO of, you know, our large hospital Parkview Medical Center here. And how was that being a wife at, to a CEO of a hospital? Uh, initially, it was terrifying. Um, the previous CEO, uh, C.W. Smith and his wife, Jan, were just incredibly gracious folks. And for instance, the Christmas party where they would have the board and some of the um, important people of Parkview, they had that party at their house. And it was a lovely house and it was beautifully decorated. And I thought, oh my gosh, am I going to have to do that too? And mm -hmm. uh, that really <laughs> terrified me. But um, but you got out of that, right? I got out of that Whew. because we lived in Pueblo West and there was two things. One, I'm not sure that our house was really big enough to accommodate all those folks. But secondly, you know, Pueblo West has no street lights. It's dark. You know, mm -hmm. you're doing this thing at Christmas. So I kind of we kind of said, oh, I think it would be better if we just had that in town or had it at a different um, venue. So I got out of the the uh, uh, pressure of, you know, having that Hosting, at my house, yeah. house. But, um, you know, it, it really was, what a privilege. It was just really a privilege to be um, part of that, uh, of the, you know, responsibilities that Mike had, the, uh, the opportunities to be at the different dinners that benefit, you know, wonderful people in Pueblo. So, it, yeah, it was a, you know, incredible privilege, what oh, we got to do. I love it. Well, you two are just some of the the most genuine people I know, and what a blessing you are to our community. So thank you for everything that, that you do. Oh, well, thank you. So, Miss Dotsie, what is your why? What is my why? Um, my why, I think, is, because, is my belief that we're part of a society, we're part of a community, we're part of a tribe. And honest to goodness, every single person, if everybody would just put in a little bit of effort um, it, it would just make, you know, it would make your community that much better, whether that's bending down and picking up a piece of trash, whether it's um, a kind word to, to someone, it's offering to help. Um, I do a ton of volunteering, as you know. I enjoy that. I meet people. Um, but my why is, is a true belief that it takes a village. And giving back and, and you being a big volunteer, can you tell me a little bit about what you volunteer in? Um, well, I just came from the Pueblo West Women's League uh, meeting, and that is an organization in Pueblo West. Uh, and um, I started with that about 15 years ago, probably, um, mostly because I wanted to get to know more people in, in Pueblo West as we moved there. Um, but they raise money to then donate back to the community. And it's a group of women that has grown to about 100 oh, wow. um, of, of ladies that I, at one point, I certainly was the youngest there. Uh, I don't think I am still. But I just met a lot of really energetic, positive, helpful women uh, doing that. Um, let's see, what else am I doing right now? Some of the other things that I've done, certainly when I was in Canyon City, I volunteered at Loaves and Fishes, which is uh, for people who are in a kind of a transient state that they could spend the night there at Loaves and Fishes. It, it, you know, they fed them and housed them for a little bit. Um, Gosh, I've been on the public, you know, Parkview Foundation, mm -hmm. of course, um, Women's Foundation of Colorado, mm -hmm. um, back when Sandy Stein was involved. And, and yep, she, me as well. And then when she was gone, I'm like, and I'm done. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But really, that's kind of what happened. Yeah. Um, oh, gosh. So in my profession, and you, you may ask me about profession at some point, the profession that I got into in the medical records, um, there is a national organization there's a state organization and there's local organizations, all that are kind of tiered in, in the profession of health information management. And I've been involved in all of them. I've volunteered locally. I've run 
you know, I was a president of this or that. Um, I've been involved in the state and I've been involved in the national level, um, which has been a lot of fun. So I just, my philosophy on volunteering, Jenny, is if I'm going to be part of an organization, I may as well be a doer, not just sort of a bump on a log listening. Oh, amen. Because mm -hmm. why not? I'm going to be there anyway. So I may as well, you know, gift them with some of my time to be secretary or treasurer or vice president or whatever uh, they need. So you would say if you are going to volunteer, make sure you step up and take a role and, and do your part. Yeah, you may as well. You're going to be there anyway. You may as well, you know, contribute. And surprisingly, the number of people who will not and um, is, is amazing to me that they, they won't do it. And I don't and I think it's I think it's not that they won't because they won't. But people don't have that confidence, maybe mm -hmm. um, to do it. And so if you do have the confidence out there, um, you know, step up and raise your hand and say, I'll, I'll help. I love that. Now, did you always want to get into into the health field growing up? I don't think so. No. Um, that was actually a kind of a dumb luck that I ran into the profession I did. Um, I started volunteering at Children's Hospital in, in uh, Denver, and they had a job. I was working on MBA at the time. Um, they had a job in uh, medical records as a file clerk, and I thought, well, what the heck, I can, I can take, you know, if I'm going to be here, I may as well, you know, get a job and get paid for it. And I got into the department um, just as this file clerk and realized how deep it was, how much there was going on that most people don't know. Um, and then I became intrigued by that and uh, went back to school and got a degree in it. And that was back in 1980. So um, I've been, uh, or 85, I guess, I've been in that ever since. Oh, so wow. it was really kind of dumb luck, but I'll t I will tell you what I think about professions is, and it was, it, it just worked out well, is to... Pick a profession that um, that uses your strengths, mm -hmm. and it turns out that I'm very organized and um, a little bit of a perfectionist, and, and there's a lot of data and things that go on in the health information world, and so it matches my personality really well, mm. but that, like I said, it was kind of dumb luck that I ran into it or, um, you know, found that. And, you know, your goal is to, to work for five more years. Do you see yourself doing that for five more years, or was there oh, yeah. anything else on your bucket list? No, I'm, uh, I'm actually on, and it's kind of sad, but it's, I'm on the downhill sl side of the profession, where, um, which is, it, it, like I said, it can be kind of sad if you look at it that way. But um, Oh, no. I, I think was, it's exciting. You know, I mean, I started as a file clerk. I ended up as a director of a department. I became a consultant, um, you know, got to travel around. I was teaching a lot. That was a tremendous amount of fun. That's I'm awesome. kind of on the downhill side where I'm, I, I will call it, quote, just a coder. But it's, it's a very limited uh, responsibility, mm -hmm. and that's kind of comforting after being a consultant where they sort of expect you to know a little bit about everything, um, and there's a lot of pressure there. This is just a very limited job description, and at this point in my career, that's just perfect. That's awesome. Yeah. And when you do retire, do you have anything on your bucket list? Oh, my gosh. Travel, travel, travel. Oh, I love it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> where are some of your places that it is a must for you? Honestly, I could I could probably just travel around this country and never get bored. There's mm -hmm. just so many nooks and crannies and places to go. Um, you know, uh, overseas and international can be fun, mm -hmm. but honestly, there's just enough right here um, on this continent, whether it's Canada, United States, Mexico, go through the Panama Canal, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. All of the above. Yeah. And do you go, what are some of your hobbies? Um, well, I exercise a lot. I know. Okay. So Dotsie and I used <laughs> to live by each other. We were like maybe three houses away and this gal would be walking every morning with her dogs and then she'd be posting photos of snakes, like the snakes are out or the tarantulas. I'm like, Dotsie, I don't do snakes. Quit posting about all of them. But I love and admire how much you value health and you use it in an everyday lifestyle. I do. Um, I'm very lucky because I was born with um, a lot of energy, so that uh, that helps a lot. And, uh, you know, not everybody is comfortable. You know, they don't have the physique or whatever that's comfortable walking. Um, I happen to enjoy that. I did used to run. I don't run anymore. Um, but, yeah, exercise is my uh, – it kind of keeps me sane, um, helps keep me so that I can have the, uh, the, the Wendy's um, – uh, little smoothies. Oh yeah, the little, the little frosty. A little frosty. Right. Yeah. It's all about balance. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, and it, truly, having moved to Canyon City, uh, I pretty much have picked up the same thing. I walk with neighbors. I go to the gym. Um, you know, there's a lot of trails there. To oh yeah, explore. we miss having you at Snap Fitness. I'm I'm at a uh, 
CrossFit gym. Oh. Yeah. And how is that? It's uh, almost too much for me, but um, okay. they let me modify, uh, you know, and they respect that. So. And what is the key to looking so amazing besides walking and CrossFit? I mean, do you eat healthy? What what do do you do? I do. I eat healthy. Um, So one of the questions that you had put out before was, you know, like what what are your challenges was? I was actually really heavy um, as a young person. um, You were. I was. And I got to uh, 170 in 10th grade. And my mother supported me and introduced me to Weight Watchers. And so I started Weight Watchers. And was able to lose, I got down to 132, which was the goal weight they had for me. Oh, but at that wow. time, it taught me how to eat. So it taught me to appreciate carrot sticks and tuna fish salad and, you know, and, and eating right. And I really think that that was an important um, time of my life to kind of get, you know, learn new things about eating. Um, but exercise, if I couldn't exercise, I would be, I would be challenged right now for sure. Because right. I do like to eat. Right. Oh, well, you probably don't even remember this, but one time I remember asking you something along the lines of like, my kids were hungry before practice and you said, well, I would always have grapes or, or carrots before I picked up the boys and we would have a snack before we'd go. Cause I think I brought up like, it's so hard not to eat like unhealthy because you go to football practice and then soccer and then you pick up McDonald's. And I was like, what did you do? And you were like, I always had a healthy snack in the car. So yeah. if there's one advice that you've given me is as a mom, always have a healthy snack in the car for your kids because they're always hungry. Yeah. I mean Well they get out of they get out of school and they're mm-hmm. they're they're crabby. They're just they're they're and you and it's like if you just immediately have a bowl of grapes or a granola bar or mm-hmm. something, honestly their behavior is better. And it, it always makes me really sad when I see people where the kids are are, you know, particularly crabby or sad or crying or, or fussing or something, and I think they're tired, they're hungry, whatever, you know, help them mm-hmm. with those things rather than just, you know, try to, um, you know, try to discipline them, discipline it out of them. Um, one of the other things I did, we just flew in from, from Boise this past weekend, and there was a couple of young kids that were on the plane, and they were just, they were loud, and you could see them hitting each other through the seats and everything. And whenever I flew, and I had three boys, mm-hmm. as you know, and they were all very close in age, I had this what I called bag of tricks. Mm-hmm. I would go to the dollar store, yep. and I would get a one of those padlocks that you use with a combination, right? Or oh. I'd get a pad of paper and a pen, or and I mean, I'm not saying or, I'm saying and. So everybody right. had this little bag of tricks to keep them entertained because mm-hmm. you can't expect them to sit on a plane, you know, and and behave themselves for two and a half hours or three hours. It didn't cost a lot. No, but and it that's was just, like, it was that's just a good preparation. idea. It's the dollar store. That's what we do too. Well, before every vacation, and they each get to pick like five things. I spent five bucks a kid, and it keeps them like staying throughout yeah. the trip. It's fantastic. It's, it's really just about preparation and kind of knowing your own kids. But I mm-hmm. always feel bad when I see kids being sort of you know, yelled at or whatever for bad behavior, because there's usually a reason behind it. It's not that they're choosing to be bad, but they're hungry, they're tired, they're, you know, something, something's mm-hmm. going on. And if you can alleviate that, it helps. So parenting advice. What are three things you would give to, like, me advice for my children as a parent? What three things, do, I mean, being prepared, I mean, that's yeah. kind of one of the things you just said. But what advice do you have for parents, especially with young families? What advice do you give them? Well, yeah, I think the, the be prepared, um, especially, you know, sometimes you're caught off guard and that's that's really too bad. But I think some people maybe don't think ahead and, and, and be prepared that way. Um, be there, be present, mm-hmm. you know, uh, for them. Um, for me, it was consistent times, like consistent um, days. Uh, we used to sit, you know, every night what's tomorrow? That was mm-hmm. the question. What's tomorrow? And we'd go through, you know, this is what we've got on the docket tomorrow. I didn't use that word, obviously. But just because I think it gave them some comfort to know what to look forward to or what the next day held. And it was just something that we did. Um, but that's also kind of who I am. I mean, I'm a planner. I, I, I always know what tomorrow is going to look like pretty much. But that's good to pass that on to them. Yeah, I think it gave them comfort, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and uh, we always had pretty consistent, you know, getting up times, going to bed times. Um, <laughs> to have all the three three boys, we, <laughs> this is kind of sad, but they'd be in the car, right, and they're little, and they're like, we want to nap, and I'd be like, no, 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 you're not going to nap, and I'd be like <laughs> smacking their knees, no, no, no. Stay awake. Because when we get home, we're all napping, mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And if you fall asleep for 10 minutes, right? You're not you, going to nap You're later. not going to nap. And, and there I'm, went my nap. <laughs> exactly. So um, so everything being very consistent and, of course, uh, you know, having all three of the boys at the same age pretty much could do that. You know, we would all sit down, all, you know, I'd look like one of those, you know, Indian dolls with all the, all the you know, the storyteller doll, right? Oh, yeah. You know, with all the little babies all over them. And we'd read a book and then we'd all take a nap, including mom. Mm-hmm. So, um and, yeah, you know, does. you're on the Influential Woman podcast. Who's been in, an inspiration in your life who's made a difference? Well, I think the first thing that most people think of is their mom. And, oh. and that, would be, that would be the case for me. Um, she was, uh, uh, <laughs> somebody sent me something once, and I have it on my wall. It says, mirror, mirror on the wall. I'm like my mother after all. And it's true. Mm-hmm. Um, she, you know, she was a professional woman before she, uh, had children, and then after she had children, she uh, was there for us. But we volunteered, and I say we because she, you know, took us along on all that. And she volunteered to the day she passed away. Really, she was, you know, involved with, um, you know, the art center in Canyon City because she had moved uh, to oh, Canyon City. Oh, so they City. moved to. Oh, okay. Yeah, she had moved to Canyon City. Um, you know, whether it was recycling, um, uh, whether it was taking brownies down to somebody who lived in a, you know, a. a really what was a, what we used to call him, I guess we used to call him a hermit or whatever, but we lived in Pennsylvania and he lived way back in the woods and we would take, you know, brownies and things to him. So I think her, and she had a lot of energy, of course, and I would say that she was um, probably the most influential, but she also had influential women around her. And so, you know, she would introduce me to them as well. That is awesome. And what were some words that would describe her? Um, well, energetic, um, giving and thinking. Oh my gosh. She, she was always thinking. And, uh, um, what did my brother say at the time? I think it was during her, like the eulogy when she passed away. Oh my gosh. I have to think of that. But she, she was never one to do things the easy way. Mm. And that would bring on laughs of people she worked with volunteering wise but he followed it up with saying, if doing it the hard way produced a better result. Mm. And that is so true. Yep, you know, she, and um, yeah, never wanted to do things the easy way if doing it the hard way produced a better result. It means you have to put the work in. Well, and you know, like the mirror on the wall, you're a lot like her. And in a lot of ways, just even hearing about that, have you been similar to her in the, in the aspect that you've surrounded yourself with a lot of amazing women? <sighs> Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, and why uh, is that important? I don't know if it's important, except for that's who who I value and who who I um, am comfortable with. Mm-hmm. You know, people who are uh, you know professional women or giving women, um, you know, volunteer women, leaders. Uh, we just relate. You know. Do you think of yourself as a leader? I do. Good. I do. I'm glad to hear that. But. But I didn't start out being a leader. You know, the first time that I was asked to speak somewhere, I was terrified, mm-hmm. you know. And I did it. I made it, I made it through it, um, practiced a lot, made it through it. And um, every time I put myself out there to do something that was a little uncomfortable, I got better at it and better at it and better at it. And now it's not so terrifying. Um, the people who never, ever put themselves out there and they're my age and they're saying, there's no way I could... I can't speak in front of anybody. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, where have you been all this time? And they haven't, they haven't been raising their hand. They haven't been doing it. Um, but once you've done it, as you know, Jenny, I'm sure the first time you did this, it was a little terrifying. Or and the- it still is. It gets, <laughs> it gets a little bit easier every yeah. time. But, yeah. So I, I guess that's what I would say to anybody is don't be afraid, you know, to try because it'll get easier, you know, the and more too, you do it. And I feel it. like that's when we grow. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think it's so good to challenge ourselves and to be able to, you know, to learn new things just so we get better as humans. Right. And I think, you know, as adults, if we can encourage the young people by, you know, asking them to come on to your podcast and they're going to be terrified, but then they'll have gotten through it. And the next time somebody asks them, they won't be afraid. Right. So, so giving them the tools for the future. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. What, how would um, your husband and boys describe you? Um. Uh, in either like five words or sentence. I mean, what would they say about you, Dotsie? And Dotsie's not your real name, right? No, it's Dorothy. It is Dorothy, but you love Dotsie. 
Because I, I love the name Dotsie. Well, that's I'm I'm glad you do. It's so much fun. <laughs> well, that's good. I feel like it's an eight year old's name, and you know, and I'm 62. But um, I tried to go with Dorothy uh, because Dotsie seemed. In fact, my brother asked me when I came back from college. He says, um, "So, are you still Dotsie?" And I was like, um, "Who else would I be?" But what he meant was, "Are you still going by the name?" Mm-hmm. And I was like, "You know, I've tried not to. I've tried Dot. I've tried Dorothy, and none of them seem to fit." So. Here I am, 62-year-old Dotsie. Oh, I love it. I um, love your name. Oh, well, thank you. Um, but as far as how they would describe me, that's mm-hmm. a very good question. Um, oh, yes. It would be, <laughs> no, <laughs> it would be uh, probably a mixed bag because um, I probably do, I think I am a little impatient. Um, somebody has had identified me as coming from the East Coast, which, of course, I do. I come from Philadelphia, so there's a there's a uh, a tone or a, an impatience of, that people bring with them, you know, who have come from the East Coast or around the East Coast, and apparently I haven't uh, I haven't gotten rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes they make fun of me because I get a little uh, a little impatient or a little crabby with people who ask questions that I think are a little silly. Um, but I think they also um, I think they had. I don't know what they think of me. I guess you should ask them. I might have to ask them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So not that one. We're, we're going to skip that one. Okay. We'll, we'll think about that. <laughs> so what other challenges have you come across in your adult life? I know you said, you know, growing up weight, you know, your weight was an issue, but you handled that. Was What was another obstacle that you overcame? Obstacle that I overcame. So one of the, okay, this may be coming from the East Coast too. And you know when we say East Coast born and raised, I think of Will Smith and uh, oh. uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air. <laughs> yeah. That could be your theme song. That would be fun. That would, that would be <laughs> that was a great show. Um, so I don't know if it's an obstacle, Mom. I love you, and I and she was a great lady. But I found she was a little she was a little judgmental, and I have found that you have to. I, I always remind myself to to not judge before you've walked a mile in their shoes, somebody's mm-hmm. shoes. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of raised with somebody, I think, who, or maybe in a household where some of that conversation went on being very judgmental about people. Uh, I have some terrible examples, and I won't, I won't repeat them. But, um, but, too, I think it was that era. Yeah. A little bit of it. And how they were, you know, it was a different time than, you know, what you went through. Right. Why, why, sh- why should we put in um, uh, the ramps on sidewalks for, you know, somebody who's, you know, disabled or in a wheelchair, and they would see somebody who, you know, was able to lift themselves up over the curb onto it, and they'd say, see, why do we need those things? <laughs> and I think, I think, oh, oh you know, I, I don't, yeah, I don't know how to, I don't know how to explain to you, um, you know, but so, yeah, maybe it was a different era, but my challenge every day is to um, to not judge until you've walked a mile in someone's shoes because um, there's so many examples where somebody makes a judgment and then, or, you know, about, I don't know what, maybe an illness, a back pain or something like that, and then they get back pain and they're like, oh, now yeah. I get it. Mm-hmm. Well, why did you have to assume it was a fake before that or that right. they were, they were you know what I mean? So I'm try- I've tried all my life, and you asked me what my challenge was. That is a challenge for me all the time to... Um, be compassionate mm-hmm. for things that I don't understand because mm-hmm. I haven't experienced them. I love that. Be compassionate for what you don't understand. Mm-hmm. I love that, Dotsie. I really do. Mm. What's um, what's one of your all-time favorite memories of as a kid? Getting sap on the velvet watch band on my Timex watch (laughs) (laughs) and getting in trouble for it. (laughs) And how many siblings did you grow up with? Um, I grew up really with just one uh, brother. brother. Yeah, just he's three years older than me. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we lived in the woods in Pennsylvania, and um, I like to climb trees because, you know, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. And I was a little girl and got a little watch that had a velvet watch band, and I got sap on it. Kind of ruins the velvet watch band. That's um, all right. But that kind of, um, I think that living, living rural and living um, in the woods and exploring the woods is is one of my favorite memories. So in Pennsylvania, is there a lot of wooded areas in in Philly? Oh well, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Oh, okay, just I was outside of Pennsylvania. I was oh, outside okay. of Philadelphia. Okay, because I was like, oh, I don't not know. in the city, not okay. in the city. Well, I've never been. I've just been to the airport. Well, so. have you have you watched Concrete Cowboy? The no. movie. It's on Netflix. No. 
that's a whole different aspect of Philadelphia, and it has to do with cowboys and in in the city, okay. which I didn't know about either. But it was very interesting. And what do you do for self care? I know you exercise. You know, mm-hmm. and you, that, that's very important to you. But what else do you do for you, and why is it important? Um, well, I you know the older we get. Uh, you have to spend more time taking care of yourself, but it's also easier because I don't have the kids now. Honestly, I go to bed so early and I love it. <laughs> so I'm early to bed, early to rise. Mm-hmm. Um, we've turned into those people who want to eat early um, and and be done with, you know, eating, f- finished eating dinner, you know, early. Uh, I do exercise. Um, uh, what used to be, a, you know, a, a young partying spirit is now a one and done and happy. Mm-hmm. Um, so just, yeah, I do take care of myself, but I feel well. Mm-hmm. So I just that do things so to make myself feel well. Yeah. Who cooks in the family? You or Mike? Me. You are. So you're a really good cook. Uh, no. Oh, <laughs> so you're not willing to share like, what was your, your boys' favorite recipe and would you be willing to share it? Okay. So, um, yeah, when the boys were young, you know, yeah. we, I cooked a lot and, um, uh, I was great, and remember Kendra? You know Kendra. Yeah, um, she's my cousin. Okay, that's right. Um, she. Uh, Are you she, going to her wedding, by the way? I don't know. Oh, well, she's see. getting married in June. I'm excited for yeah. her. Yeah, I followed. I followed that story. Um, she's a beautiful lady, but um, and now she has three boys, so she's kind of you know we kind of laugh about that. But um, I, I I was really good at cooking something and cooking a lot of it so that we would then have it in the freezer so that you could, of course. You know, three boys, again, you know, it's like you're an instant cook. It's like, you're hungry. I'm hungry right this second. <laughs> I need to go to the freezer. I thaw it, and, you know, we can have dinner really fast. So, um, you know, they love biscuits and gravy, and I had a bread maker and made homemade bread and, um, mm. um, you know, just different things that, that were easy to make and then freeze and have, have uh, pretty fast. That's really what I was pretty good at. Did you love being a mom of three boys, a boy mom? Oh, I did. Did you ever wish you would have a little girl? So Mike thought that we should maybe try again for your little girl, and I said, hell no. Well, no, not after <laughs> three in, what, two years. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah. That, that does a toll on you, I'm sure, where you're like, no. We had a blast. Yeah. We just had a blast, yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite kid? No. They're not listening. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. No, it's no. hard to pick favorites, right? You yeah. just love them all in their own in their own ways. Oh and my gosh, and they're so individual. Even the twins are very different in their own ways. Yeah. I can't believe how much they've grown up. Yeah, like it's crazy, and they're they're so handsome. Well, and I mean, I just always remember them as like the fast, you know, the Baxter boys in seventh and eighth grade, and when they were built like little little sticks, they didn't have any any muscles or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. So what's something that nobody knows about you? Oh, dear. This is not going to be a question you're going to want to put in there because I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> I'm a pretty open book, so I don't, think, I don't think there's anything, um, you know, and I, I appreciate that the, you know, sharing of information. I'm not, you know, I don't have big secrets or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So, Who's your best friend and why? My best friend is Michelle Erickson. Oh, I love her. Yeah, yeah. And have you guys been friends forever? Well, it started out as the soccer moms, Mm -hmm. you know, um, and uh, when the kids were, uh, in fact, and it's kind of funny, that whole sports thing, that my boys' best friends are still from soccer, from when they started playing soccer, you know, years and years ago. And the parents um, would get together, you know, and and the moms, especially when it was time for soccer practice, we would walk around 24th Street for an hour and a half sometimes. Getting your Talking, exercise on. Mm-hmm. Get your exercise in and visiting. And um, she and I have remained friends since then. And uh, uh, we walk all the time and talk all the time. And she's just, she's an inspiration. You should have her on. I know. She is wonderful. Mm-hmm. And I remember when you got, you know, recognized at the Parkview Gala, um, she was the one that were, was speaking on your behalf and yeah. said wonderful things about you. Yeah. What's been your proudest accomplishment? How does the accomplishment? It's a hard one. Well, it is. Um, I think, you know, certainly raising th- three boys to the point that they're at, mm-hmm. you know, um, and uh, which, although I'm not so sure, Jenny, whether, and you can take this however you want to, but uh, I'm never sure whether uh, a child's accomplishments are any more my you know, responsibility is success or their failures are my responsibility for their failures. I think these kids, 
um, you know, people are kind of born with a lot of their own agendas and their own strengths, and I can help guide them. Mm-hmm. But like I said, I don't know if I'm any more responsible for their successes than I am any of their failures. So, um, oh, I think you are. Moms have a big, you know, I mean, just like you, your influential woman was your mother. Like mothers have a huge impact on children. But yes, it's what they do with it is mm-hmm. another path that they get to take on their own. But we get to help guide them. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you've got a lot of recognition. You've got a lot of awards throughout your life. Is there anything where you were just, I made it or I can't believe I got this recognition or... Well, see, recognition is an interesting thing um, because that's not why I do any of these things that I do. I know that about you. Um, You're very humble. Well, I don't know if I'm humble. I just, that's just not why I do it. You know, Uh, we were just talking at the Women's League about, um, you know, should we give the board gifts at the end of the year to say thank you? And and we were talking about where does the money come from? And, you know, you have restrictions when you're part of a nonprofit and all that stuff. And I piped in and I said, honestly, I don't need a gift. Mm -hmm. That's not why I'm doing this. Other people feel very strongly that they should get a gift. So I have to respect the fact that everyone doesn't see things the way I do. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, recognition is very nice. There's no doubt about it. I mean, who doesn't like to, you know, be recognized for what they've done? Um, I just, I I feel so privileged to um, have been raised by the mom I was raised by, to have been given the opportunities so that I'm comfortable leading and then, you know, you, you know, then, then you will be recognized for that. But that's not why I do it at all. Um, but I don't know. It's just been fun. You know, it's much more fun for me to be involved than it is to, you know, just be sitting at a table watching it, watching it all go on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, any woman out there, what other advice would you give them? Any advice that has just helped you along the way be the woman you are today? I think just don't be afraid to try. Really, um, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't be doing. I wouldn't have had the opportunities to do what I do if I hadn't. If I had been afraid to try, and when somebody gave me an opportunity to do it or said, like Jenny did, would you come be on my podcast? Um, and you're like, no, I don't need recognition. I don't well, do things. But I love that about you. Like most people are like, oh, you want to honor me? Like you know what I'm saying? And they feel proud, and either like you know, I'm I'm doing the right things, and you are just so humble, and I admire that about you at the same time. Well, thank you. But, um, but I think you know, for just just don't be afraid. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, try if somebody gives you an opportunity to you know put yourself out there, go outside your comfort zone a little bit. Um, for young women, uh, set yourself up to be independent. And so that you're not reliant on somebody else. I mean, it's great to have a partner. It's great to have a husband or, you know, a partner in any way. But set yourself up to be Mm self-sufficient. And successful on your own. Yes, yes. Um, And then have fun. Just have fun. Mm -hmm. And what's your favorite thing to do for fun? Travel. Travel. Mm-hmm. That's what and fills just, your cup. Yeah. Well, and that's why you you know you're saying I'm taking pictures of all this stuff. You know, snakes and tarantulas. <laughs> Those things give me pleasure. It's like it's nature. I'm outside in nature, and Pueblo West is full of that. And that's mm-hmm. part of why you know, it's part of the beauty out there. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it's pretty birds or whether it's rattlesnakes. Mm-hmm. You know. Do you miss Pueblo West? Not so much. No. Um, believe it or not, but Pueblo, but Canyon has our family there. Okay. Yeah. Because so y'all lived there for how long? We were there for ten years. Okay. Before Pueblo West. So Mike, uh, this isn't a this podcast isn't about <laughs> influential women, but it's Mike. So he came from a family of eight kids. Oh my Lanta. And five of them with their spouses and kids and grandkids and great are still in Canyon. Okay. So okay. When we get together, it can be twenty five people, mm. and that's fun. Yeah. Absolutely. You have that kind of family here in the Pueblo area. Yeah. I do. That's why I'll probably never leave Pueblo. But that's yeah. why I was just curious why Canyon and, you know, yeah. it's not far from Pueblo. Yeah, no, it's it is um, it's it's family is what took us back there. And it's been a ton of fun. Oh, good. Well, I'm yeah. so happy for you. Well, thank you. Is there anything else that we should know about Miss Dotsie Baxter? No, I think we've covered everything. Okay. Well, I have one more question for you. Okay. Mine does that too. What does the <laughs> word influential mean to you? Just the word influential. So that's, it means a lot of things, doesn't it? Today in social media, being an influencer is, um, you know, promoting either yourself or promoting somebody else, you know, and being an influencer. And that's, 
that's, you know, today's world of being an influencer. I think um, being an influencer f- to me is being a mentor, um, being a leader, um, but and and then and bringing people along with you, you know, um, uh, encouraging others who you see a spark a sparkle in their eye who are curious but maybe a little afraid. You bring them along with you, um, you know. Open say if you ever have any questions, come to me. Uh, that kind of thing is is how I I see being influential. Well, thank you. You are definitely an influential woman. You are a mentor. You are a leader, and you are so inspiring. And I'm grateful for your conversation today and you being here. And uh, cheers to the next five years before retirement. But until then, who knows? You got your boys graduating, yeah? Um, two of them. Have two graduated. already have, but one more at vet school. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That is so, so cool. Well, thank you again. You are just. A lovely lady in so many ways, and I just appreciate you being here. Well, thank you very much. That's a wrap.